Here's your assignment for next week. Listen to this because it's a little bit different from what we've been doing. Today, of course, we're going to finish up the history books, the books of history in the Old Testament, which means that next week we're going to look at the, um, the wisdom literature, the poetry books. Okay? That will be fun doing all of that in uh, an hour and a half. But that's what we're going to do next week, which is do the wisdom literature next week. Now, this is what I want you to do. Instead of writing a paper or reading something and writing a paper, I want you to choose one of your favorite psalms. Ah, oh, yes. And then I want you to, uh, you can write it out or just think about it, a summary of that psalm. And I want you to share it with us in the class next week. Why that particular psalm is special to you, what you think it means. Um, take a few minutes giving all of you guys a chance to um, kind of contribute a little bit during the class and tell us what your favorite psalm is and why it's your favorite psalm, right? So that'll be for next week. So you don't have a reading assignment per se, you just find a psalm, read it, and tell us why you like it. So we don't have to do the highlights, the summary no. for you. We don't have to hand it in. No. no. Okay. You don't have to hand anything in next week. We'll just talk about it together. Okay. All right. Let's uh, pray together and we'll get started. <clears throat> Thank you again, Father, that um, you are the God of history. You have written the history of our world, and that includes your special care and protection for the nation of Israel, and we've been seeing in the Word of God how Israel fits into world history and the important place that it plays, Father. So many lessons that we can learn from, from the nation of Israel, and uh, we pray, Father, that as we uh, look at some of the last of the historical books this, morning, this afternoon, we would learn lessons that we can apply to our lives and draw us closer to yourself. Thank you, Father, for the Old Testament and for the important place that it has in the Word of God and in the life of the church even today. Bless us as we study together. May your spirit guide and direct us, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. All right, so we're going to finish up the, uh, the his books of history this afternoon. We uh, said last week that there are five periods of Old Testament history. Let me just recap that very quickly. First is the patriarchal period. The patriarchs are Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph, those four men. They cover from about 2000 BC to 1875 BC. That's the period of the patriarchs. Then there's, there's the theocratic period. This is the time when Israel was ruled by God. It um, begins with the Exodus and goes through the book of Ruth. Um, God was the king. He was the ruler over the nation. Um, people didn't always think of it that way, but that's the way it was set up. God was the ruler. There was no human king in the nation. God was the king. It was a theocracy. Third is the monarchical period. And this is the period when Israel had a king, a human king. They were crying for a king because they wanted to be like the other nations around them. And so God raised up, first of all, King Saul, and then, of course, David and his son Solomon. And then the kingdom divided, and there's a whole bunch of kings after that that you've all read about for, the, for this afternoon, from first and second kings. That's the kingdom of the period of the monarchy. Then there's the exilic period, the period of the exile, which is the time during the captivity. It goes from about 605 to 536 BC. Um, there was no king. There were governors that kind of ruled uh, on and off, but basically Israel and Judah were under the captive of foreign nations. And then finally, the Restoration Period. This is the period starting in 536 B.C. when the people migrated back to the land of Israel, back to uh, Jerusalem. 
Uh, not all of them returned, of course, but many of them did. And uh, that takes us up to the end of the, the Old Testament. So we've got those five periods of history. We're right now in the middle of the monarchical period. We started talking about uh, Saul and David last week. And uh, we want to pick it up today with 1 Kings and then go on through some of the other kings that are mentioned in, in the scripture. First and Second Kings was originally one book. It was just called The Kings. It's the history of the kings of Israel from Solomon through the captivity. It um, is likely that Jeremiah wrote First and Second Kings. Don't know that precisely for sure, but a lot of the evidence seems to point to Jeremiah as the author of Kings. It begins with, uh, with Solomon, who of course was uh, David's son. Solomon was a uh, very unique and capable leader, ruler. He possessed great um, wisdom. We see the prayer that uh, Solomon prayed in uh, chapter 3 of 1 Kings, when uh, God basically said to him, Ask of me anything you want. And I'll give it to you. Can you imagine that? God coming to you and saying, what do you want? I'll give it to you. And Solomon, being the wise man that he was, even then, he said, well, I want, I want wisdom. I want the ability to rule this people in a way that will honor God. And God answered that prayer and gave him unusual, special wisdom. Um, there is an interesting story at the end of chapter 3, an illustration of the wisdom that uh, Solomon possessed right from the beginning, the story of these two women who come to Solomon and they have a, a, a baby. And the one woman claims that uh, the baby was hers, the other woman says, no, it's my baby, your baby died, and um, what do we do, King Solomon, Who, whose baby is it? And Solomon got a, a, a sword and said, all right, I'll tell you what we'll do. We'll just cut the baby right in half. You can have half, she can have half. That's fair. And of course, the true mother of the baby said, no, 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 don't do that. Don't kill the baby. Let her have it if, if that's where we have to do it. And Solomon knew, of course, then who the mother was. And um, he goes on then to display his great wisdom in a lot of other ways uh, throughout the, the book. He, um, he had material wealth that was almost beyond belief. In um, verse, um, beginning of verse 20 of chapter 4, it, it describes some of the, uh, the wealth that, that Solomon possessed. Um, in one place, I can't find it right off hand, but it talked about um, other kings of the nations coming and giving him tribute up to the amount of um, a lot. <laughs> and, and I saw in a footnote someplace that in our terms today it would be equivalent to like um, 250 tons of gold. Just, you know, tribute from other nations. This is the, this is the, the golden era of Israel during the reign of Solomon, during the early years of, of King Solomon. He was recognized for his wealth, recognized for his wisdom, and um, it was just incredible the things that he was able to do and, and he possessed. Notice in verse 26 of chapter 4, it says, Solomon also had 40,000 stalls for horses for his chariots. And um, that's kind of interesting because there's a, a statement in 1 Kings chapter 10 where it says that he had 4,000 stalls. Uh-oh. We have a discrepancy in the Bible, a mistake in the Bible. One says 40,000, one says 4,000. I think common sense and probably a little thinking would have us to believe that 4,000 is much closer to what was the actual number of stalls for his horses. You have to understand again how the, how the Word of God was written, how it was copied by scribes. And it would be so easy just to 
kind of lose your train of thought for a second and add an extra zero to a number. And that seems likely what happened here. It's probably 4,000 stalls for his horses, which is, in itself is, is an enormous number. As far as his religious achievements are concerned, Solomon was responsible for the building of the temple. Uh, David wanted to, but God told him that he could not do it because he was a man of war characterized by bloodshed, but David did a lot to start the preparation for the temple, gathering a lot of materials and so forth. We'll talk more about that in a moment. But um, the actual building of the temple falls to Solomon. And um, he, he in, in chapter 8, there's the uh, prayer of dedication after the temple had been um, completed. And uh, it's one of those amazing prayers we have a few times in the Old Testament. Solomon's praising God and thanking God for um, all that he was able to do. Solomon's kingdom was also characterized by political stability in verses 9 and 10. In, verse, in chapter 10 and verse 7, um, uh, there is a reference to the, um, that's not the right verse, I don't know why I put that down, but there's a reference to the, uh, in, in chapter 10 and verse 3, Solomon answered her all her questions. Nothing was hidden from the king that could not be explained, that he could not explain to her. When the queen of Sheba had seen all the wisdom of Solomon, the house that he had built, the food of his table, the seating of his official, the attendance of his servants, she just kind of just lost it. This is just utterly amazing. Never seen anything like that. Anybody know who the queen of Sheba is? Where is she from? Egypt, Ethiopia. Um, I guess Southern Arabia. There's um, there's a group of people that are referred to a couple of times in the Old Testament called the Sabeans, S-A-B-E-A-N. Uh, that's probably related to Sheba. In fact, that may have been the city of the uh, Sabeans, and um, she was queen at that time. And being a queen, even though it was one of those city-states back in those times, was a pretty big deal. She probably had all kinds of wealth herself. But when she came and saw Solomon's kingdom, it just blew her away. And could not comprehend everything that Solomon did. God truly blessed him. As it says in chapter 3, because Solomon asked God for wisdom, God also blessed him with financial um, material wealth and, and political wealth and, and just about everything else you could imagine. It was the golden era of, um, of Israel's rule in the world. But Solomon had his weaknesses, as did all of the, all of the leaders in the Old Testament. We saw David last week, it happened to him. Chapter 11, and uh, on talks about Solomon's weakness. And his weakness was King Solomon loved many foreign women, along with the daughter of Pharaoh, Moabites and Ammonites, Edomites, Sidonians, Hittite women. And uh, the problem, of course, was that God said to Israel way back when, when you get into Canaan, you're going to drive out all these people. If I tell you to destroy a whole city, then destroy the whole city. Don't let anybody survive. And surely don't intermarry with any of the people that you come across in those foreign countries. And uh, Solomon violated that warning of God. And... Um, it, it clearly became his downfall. It says he had 700 wives. Wow. Something. <laughs> <It's up there. laughs> <laughs> That's a lot. Nobody understood me. <laughs> and 300 concubines. Oh my goodness. <laughs> What's a concubine? Um, Servant of a wife? Yeah. Uh, yes. That's like, that's, that's like a 
like white number two, the yeah. one that you uh, have on the side. Uh, but, <laughs> but understand, there's no, there's no immoral stigma attached to a concubine. She was um, a legitimate, recognized wife, but she was not on the same level as the first wife, the official wife. She was there, it started really, because of the problem of these wealthy men who needed to have sons in order to continue their, their, uh, their family, their dynasty, and sometimes they didn't, their wives wouldn't produce sons. And so another woman was brought in to, uh, to produce a son for him. Abraham's a classic example, Abraham and Hagar. So they were recognized as having a, a rightful place in a family, but they, they had no authority over the family. Uh, the, the king or whoever could just dismiss them if he wanted to. But it's not like he just chose a different concubine to sleep with every night. That, that's not the kind of idea that, that we're supposed to get in thinking of a concubine. It was just there to, to meet some of these needs in case the family could not have male sons, male children. Now, why you need 300 concubines, I'm not sure. <laughs> or 700 wives. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, this is weakness. But it was very, it was, it was very commonplace back in, in that day. Oh. You also have the problem right here, and we're going to talk about this for a minute, of um, Solomon's polygamy. Again, this was not uncommon in, in the Old Testament. Solomon was not the first or the only, to be sure. Um, Adam, uh, um, David had many wives and, and many other people in the Old Testament. But the problem is that God said, each man is to have his own wife. Um, God pronounced from the beginning monogamy as his ideal for marriage. How do we know that was the ideal in the Old Testament? Where, where did we get that from? Genesis? Genesis. Right. Specifically. Adam and Eve. Adam and Eve, of course. Mm -hmm. God created things perfect in the beginning. This is what a family is going to be, folks. Mm -hmm. A wife and a husband. Adam and Eve. That's it. Yeah. We know it from the New Testament because uh, Paul says in 1 Corinthians 7, each man is to have his own wife, each wife has his own husband, and so forth. So monogamy is God's ideal. But yet Abraham and David and Solomon had many wives, and it seems as though God blessed them. So how do we explain that? God tolerated. Okay. God tolerated it. Can you give me something else that kind of corresponds to that? Hmm. Some other I think that, interesting um, development that's along those same lines, Danny? I think that, um, you know, like you said, um, God didn't um, allow it. You know, it wasn't part of God's plan, but when it happened, he knew. Um, but what he did was when he did it, it was always consequences. So okay. what happened was, was that, um, you know, that's what he dealt with. With um, Abraham, with his, um, with the other child, they had the, the issue with that one, which is still going on today. Ishmael, you know, right. Yeah. And with, um, you know, David and all his, you know, sons, his problem with them trying to kill him and everything else. Yeah. And Solomon and, you know, all of them. So I think it was that um, he never allowed it, but there was always... Um, the problem that, you know, that sin will come back to um, always, you know, haunt them to right. their, um, in their lives. Right. What did God say in the Old Testament about divorce? Why did he permit divorce? Because people complain. Okay. And what do you
what he said specifically is because of the hardness of their hearts. God knew they were going to do it. So he basically said, okay, but I'm going to I'm going to limit it. I'm going to control it. If you're going to have a divorce, you got to follow this pattern. I mean, it's all laid out for us in, in the book of Deuteronomy. So God was not putting his approval on divorce, but he was saying, I know you're going to do it anyway. Then here's how you're going to do it. And it was because of the hardness of their hearts, because of their sinfulness. And so I think it's the same thing with polygamy. Um, these, these men were caught up in the, uh, the culture of the day, and they did what the other kings did, and God said, well, um, that's what you're going to do, you're going to pay the consequences for it. And as Danny said, we've seen Solomon's life, of course, the consequences that, um, that, that it caused in, in his own life. Wow. Um, beginning in chapter 12, at the end of chapter 12, he had the division of the kingdom. Now, after after Saul and David and Solomon, that's the end of um, the, the the United Kingdom, and now the kingdom is divided into two major sections. There is um, uh, the southern kingdom, which is called Judah. And that was started by Solomon's son, Rehoboam. After Solomon died, Rehoboam was chosen to be the king. That would be the natural succession. But the, um, the people of the north rebelled against him and didn't want him to rule over them. And so they started, they broke away and started the northern kingdom, which we refer to as Israel. And that was headed up by Jeroboam one of uh, the captains of Solomon's army. So after about 120 years of one king over the, the United Nation, now you have two kings in this divided situation. The southern kingdom were just two. The northern kingdoms were, the northern kingdom was 10, 10 tribes. A couple things to keep in mind about all of this. Um, you probably could pick this up from your reading in First, Second Kings today. Every one of the kings of the Northern Kingdom were wicked kings. Yeah. They were all bad. <laughs> Every one of them. It's kind of interesting. And it's interesting to note, and you probably wouldn't pick this up just by reading, but. Um, did a little more study, you would find there, there were 20, 20 kings in the, in the whole northern kingdom. But among those 20 kings, there were ultimately nine dynasties. different dynasties. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That is, nine different families at one point claimed to be the king over Israel. And they served, and the sons served, and then they died off, and another dynasty started. Nine different times that happens in the, in the Northern Kingdom. In the Southern Kingdom of Israel, however, there's only one dynasty. And that's the Davidic dynasty, dynasty of David. Why? Because God said in 2 Samuel 7 that through David's family, was going to come the ultimate king whose kingdom was going to last forever and ever. That's the Lord Jesus, of course. And he comes through David, and there can't be any break in that dynasty. So for the 20 kings that are raised up in the southern kingdom, um, they're not all godly men, to be sure, but they were all of the Davidic family. They all fall into line so that that line that started with, uh, with Adam and then Seth and it goes on, that would ultimately produce the Messiah, has been unbroken all the way through Old Testament history. So you have 20 kings in each kingdom. All the kingdoms in the north are bad guys. Uh, a few of the kingdoms in the south are good. 
they had uh, um, the benefit of some of the prophets that God raised up during that time that, that led the nation in the way they should go. The kings sought out the prophets once in a while and followed what they said. Um, so there's, there's kind of a mixed bag in the southern kingdom as far as uh, the spirituality of the nation is concerned. The primary prophet that God raised up during the, uh, this period of time was uh, Elijah in, in chapters 11 through 17 of uh, 1 Kings. Elijah was a great man, as we just mentioned a few moments ago. You're all familiar with the story of um, his confrontation with the prophets of Baal in chapter 18. And, and uh, that's just a marvelous, marvelous story of God's uh, proving to false prophets that he is the true God. And all you guys are just a bunch of shysters and uh, you can't do anything that you claim to be able to do. God is the true God. Um, he had to deal with Ahab and Jezebel, who were quite a pair. And, um, in spite of all that God revealed to, to Elijah on Mount Carmel, uh, as Danny mentioned a few moments ago, here comes Jezebel running after him, and, and Elijah takes off and is ready to die, and he says, I can't do anything, does God take me, and I'm the only one here who's serving you, and I'm like just crying over the tree. And God shows him that, no, that's not the case, there were still others who were serving me at that time. Look at uh, chapter 22 and verse 22 of 1 Kings for just a moment. <clears throat> uh, let's start back in, um, in verse 19. Micaiah said, Therefore, hear the word of the Lord. I saw the Lord sitting on his throne, and all the host of heaven standing beside him on his right hand and on his left. And the Lord said, Who will entice Ahab, that he may go up and fall at Ramoth Gilead? And one said one thing, and another said another. Then a spirit came forward and stood before the Lord, saying, I will entice him. And the Lord said to him, By what means? And he said, I will go out, and I will be a lying spirit in the mouth of all his prophets. And he said, You are to entice him, and you shall succeed. Go out and do so. Therefore, the Lord has put a lying spirit in the mouth of all your prophets. The Lord has declared disaster for you. What do you think about that story? Is God here commending lying as an appropriate means of uh, accomplishing his will? Well, he used calamity and everything else, so, you know, it's what, you know, what he chooses to allow, you know. Even when he tells us that... Um, it's impossible for him to lie, that we are not supposed to lie, um, but it seems as though he is putting his stamp of approval on this guy who wants to lie to Ahab to convince him to do something. Then also, too, that a lot of times, you know, these things were going to happen anyway. It's just that, um, yeah, he knows he's going to do it. You know, like he said, he was going to do it anyway. He was going to take the the word of these these people anyway. So it just, you know, we just have the um, sort of foreknowledge of knowing what's going to happen before it does. Okay. You know, in the book. It seems to be re a reasonable thought. You know, uh, God uses bad things and turns them to gold. And, you know, we think, uh, we, we were talking last week, I think, about uh, who, was, uh, who was the prostitute that uh, uh, Rahab, Rahab, Rahab that's what it was right, that, uh, that lied, you know, and, uh, you know, it's certainly not God's ideal or, or plan that, that we should not tell the truth. 
and yet uh, she was saved and appears in the line of the Messiah. So what? What? Uh, who knows God's ways? If things are available to God, God seems to use what He wants to mm-hmm. to bring about His outcomes. Yeah. Right? He does what His will does, and He already knows what's going to happen. Stop. Like, how about when he, uh, Jesus himself, he told that one guy not to tell everybody, you know, when he, clear, he cleared his eyes and yeah. he made him see? Yeah. He goes, like, don't tell anybody. <laughs> <laughs> Come on. <laughs> you know what he's got to do. <laughs> okay. Any other thoughts? Well, just like today, with all this going on in the world, even though we see lies and all these things going on, this is still leading to the God's will. Yep. And, uh, you know, we we can't understand it. But we do know that it's been written in Revelation what's happening, what's going to go on. Mm-hmm. And he uses not only the saints, but the sinners also to where it will be performed. Okay. I mean, I still don't understand what you're, what you're saying here. I mean, I, I'm reading it, I'm saying, wow, you know, that's a, that's a hard one. You know, because he does tell us, you know, we're not supposed to lie. Just like we're not supposed to go to the divine spirits, but he did that last one with yeah. Samuel. Yeah. How many times in the book of Exodus does it tell us that God hardened Pharaoh's heart? Few. But on other occasions, he hardened his own Pharaoh, heart. Pharaoh hardened his own. Yeah. Uh, right. Um, in the in the New Testament, in Second Thessalonians, it talks about God's going to send a strong delusion in the end days. A strong delusion. He's going to send something that people are going to think is real, but it's going to delude them. Well, why would God do something like that? Well, because we have to discern the difference between God's directive will and what God deems will absolutely come to pass as opposed to his permissive will, uh-huh. things that God allows to happen, which includes <laughs> bad things. And we've said it before, the classic example of that, of course, is the cross. God holds those Jews in Jerusalem and the Roman soldiers in Jerusalem and Herod and Pilate, he holds them accountable for Christ's death. They did it. But God used all of that wickedness to accomplish his greatest purpose for his son. So I think that's what's happening here. He's not commanding that this guy lie, but he is uh, is exercising his sovereign right to use something that's not true in order to convince Ahab that he needs to do something that's ultimately going to lead to his demise. It's one of these situations that we have many times in the Old Testament where you don't want to base your theology upon this. You don't want to try to make it seem as if, well, it's okay, you know, if I lie, if I don't tell the truth, I'm not quite forthcoming because look what it says here. This is a unique situation that God used at that particular time for his purposes. He allowed something to happen that accomplished what he wanted. And as Dave said, praise God that he does that. Think about your own life. Some of the things that you've gotten yourself into, the messes you've had in your own life, and does God ultimately turn it around for good purposes in your life? You got it. Pastor, doesn't he say, Pastor Smith, he yeah. says, God's ways are not our ways. Absolutely. His ways are higher than our ways. So as we think, you know, yeah. like you say, he's sovereign. That's exactly right. <laughs> exactly right. Um, okay, let's go to Second Kings real quickly. Second Kings deals with the deterioration of the northern tribes. 
and um, it's it's really all these sad stories of the sin of all of Israel's kings after Elijah comes Elisha. <clears throat> Uh, also include, during this time, was also the, uh, the ministries of Obadiah and Joel, and concluded with Isaiah. He was the prophet that prophesied during this, um, this later part of, of, um, of the kingdoms. Hosea, a man named Hosea, was the last king of Israel when they were taken into captivity by the Assyrians in 722 B.C. That's in chapter 17 of, uh, of 2 Kings. Um, just an interesting point in, uh, in chapter 17, where it says that the king of Assyria brought people from Babylon, Kuta, Ava, Hamath, and Sepharim, and placed them in the cities of Samaria instead of the people of Israel. Um, you ever wonder where the New Testament Samaritans came from? This is probably it right here. And when the Assyrians um, were dealing with Israel at that particular time, they brought these foreign people into Israel, and they intermarried with, uh, with some of the Jews who were there. And uh, that most likely resulted in the uh, people that are referred to in the New Testament as the Samaritans. They were kind of this mixed breed of, of Jews and, and foreigners. That's why the Jews hated them and other people around them hated them. Samaritans in the New Testament are like, um, you know, like, like they've got leprosy. Nobody just wants to get near them. I have anything to do with them. And here's where it all starts back here in, in what the Assyrians did in bringing some of those foreign people back into uh, the country. Um, it's just a, it's almost hard reading some of the things that these kings were into. And you would think, you know, this is, this is God's people, God's country, and uh, that these men would have some sense of what it meant to serve God and to honor Him, but they generally did not. And Israel now is in a period of great decline because of the leadership of these ungodly kings. In 2 Kings, beginning in chapter 18, we have the deportation of the southern deportation of the southern tribes, and um, they, of course, were, were taken over by Babylon and uh, sent into Babylon for a period of 70 years for their captivity. Um, Two of the prominent kings, the godly kings in this area, were Hezekiah and his grandson Josiah. We're not going to get into a lot of talk about all of these men and what they did right now because we'll talk about it more when we study the prophets in our last class together in a, in a few weeks. But you've read First and Second Kings and you know what those stories are all about. First Chronicles. First Chronicles is, um, in fact, First and Second Chronicles um, really have to do with the uh, the, the temple, and um, First Chronicles deals with the preparation for the temple. It's uh, it really contains the religious history of, of Judah, the Southern Kingdom. Um, it appears as though Ezra, Ezra the priest, was the author of. Um, Chronicles, and um, it involves, it contains material that's not included in First or Second Kings. Some of it does. We see David's preparation for the building of the temple in chapters 11 through 29. David captured the city of Jerusalem from the Jebusites. God revealed to him that this is where the temple was to be built. Uh, David brought the Ark of the Covenant from Kiriath Jerim to Jerusalem, chapters 13 and 15. 
he um, instituted uh, a temple choir. And David even began writing some of the psalms at this point that were going to be used in the temple worship ultimately. On his, um, on his deathbed, David charged Solomon with the task of building the temple. Levites were chosen and given their responsibilities. Other officials in the, uh, that would be working in the, in the temple are outlined and they were given their responsibilities. And everything is set now for the, uh, the temple to be put into operation as um, Solomon takes over. And um, First Kings ends then with the death of David. Second Chronicles, um, very interesting. Like now, it very interestingly, pretty much discusses the destruction of the temple. The um, the bulk of Second Chronicles deals with the, te the deterioration and the final destruction of Solomon's temple. It was uh, completed in 960 BC, and it was a magnificent structure when it was originally built. First nine chapters talk about the, the building of the temple, and again, when you read the amount of, of gold and silver and jewels and, and the, the um, furnishings and the skill that it took to make them and the amounts of uh, of uh, gold and so forth that had to be used. It was just an incredible, incredible place. The, 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 the dome, um, the, the, there was so much gold on, on around the outside that historians talk about being able to see the reflection of the temple from miles and miles away. It was just uh, an incredibly beautiful building. Um, in chapters 10 through 36, we have the uh, history after the death of Solomon and uh, the, the division of the kingdom. Again, uh, the northern kingdom, they went against God's plan to worship in Jerusalem. That was the place where people were to worship God in the temple. The Northern Kingdom decided that they were going to try something different and uh, sort of conform to the needs of the people, and so they set up different places of worship, one in Dan and one in Bethel, and further to the south, make it more convenient for the people to worship. Why should they all have to come to Jerusalem? And um, so they set up these two places of worship, which was contrary to God's will. Um, in, in the latter part of Second Chronicles, we see the loyalty of Judah to the temple. God had chosen Jerusalem to be the place where the temple was to uh, be located. Um, Zedekiah was the last king of Judah, and he was the one who witnessed the final destruction of the temple and the uh, complete burning of the temple, all the, everything inside was looted and taken away, and um, it was just, it was burned to the ground, basically. This was Solomon's temple. We talked about this a little bit last week. When Zerubbabel came, came back to Jerusalem after the uh, captivity, he wanted to rebuild the temple. And um, I basically had to start it from scratch and, and, and rebuild it. And he did, but it wasn't quite to the lavish extreme of Solomon's temple. Um, but he did rebuild the temple so that when the people returned, there would be a place where they could worship the Lord in accordance with, with God's commandments to them. Um, all of that happened when, when Ezra first led the group of the uh, captives back into Jerusalem and um, began the work of restoring the temple. That's in the book of Ezra. Ezra and Nehemiah originally were one book. It seems as though Ezra was probably the author. 
It was written for their remnant that returned from the Babylonian captivity. We're told that Zerubbabel the priest came back with 50,000 Jewish people. And um, a short time later, Ezra returned with 2,000 more. And their purpose was to rebuild the temple in Jerusalem. It seems like the purpose of the book of Ezra is to highlight God's faithfulness to his promises. His promises to Judah. Um, he promised that they would have a temple to worship in. And even though it was destroyed, now he's fulfilling that promise by having it restored under the leadership of Ezra. Nehemiah, on the other hand, he returns to Jerusalem for the express purpose of rebuilding the city. Ezra wanted to take care of the temple. Nehemiah wants to build, rebuild the city. It's interesting, Ezra was a priest. He would be more equipped to deal with the um, religious nature of the nation and had more interest in, in rebuilding the temple. Whereas Nehemiah was, um, he was a layman. He, he just worked for a king. He was the cupbearer for King Ahasuerus. And uh, he was more concerned with the, the physical nature of the city and the political aspect and all of that. So he wanted to rebuild the city of Jerusalem. And if you've read Nehemiah in the past, you know that it really is an excellent manual of biblical leader, the leadership in, in the face of obstacles and hardships. I mean, Nehemiah was an excellent organizer and, uh, and, and planned in great detail what it was going to take in order to rebuild the city and uh, sets out to do it and accomplishes most of it in really a very short um, period of time. Um, in, um, in chapter 1 of Nehemiah, Nehemiah prays for the city. He really had a heart for the fact that the city was destroyed, the city of God, the place that God had raised up for his people. And it was a concern to Nehemiah, and he prays that he would be given the opportunity to, um, to rebuild the city. And as you read those first couple of chapters, you understand that doing a work like Nehemiah was doing, which was very important, and it was God's work, but yet it was filled with all kinds of obstacles and hardships that, that people threw in his way. People did not want the city to be rebuilt. And that's one of the great lessons of the book of Nehemiah, is that doing God's work often demands dealing with many, many obstacles, hardships. It's not always easy. And it certainly wasn't for Nehemiah. They persevered, and, um, and the walls were rebuilt. And then in, in, verse, in chapter 8, um, Nehemiah records this revival that took place in the city of Jerusalem. From a pastor's perspective, this is one of the first <coughs> chapters in the Old Testament. A couple of chapters. From a pastor's perspective. He says one of the worst? One of the best. Oh, one of the best. One of the greatest chapters, Nehemiah chapter 8. All the people gathered as one man into the square before the water gate. And they told Ezra the scribe to bring the book of the law of Moses that the Lord had commanded Israel. <coughs> so Ezra the priest brought the law before the assembly, both the men and the women, and all could understand what was heard on the first day of the seventh month. And he read from it facing before the, the square before the water gate from early morning till midday in the presence of the <coughs> men and the women, and all could understand. And the ears of all the people are attentive to the book of the law. In our church this morning, when the pastor was reading a couple of verses of the, the nativity story before his message, he asked everybody to stand. And we stood for two minutes while he read. You imagine standing from morning till midday, listening to the word of God being read. I mean, that's the key to revival. 
is listening and understanding and obeying the Word of God. And, and uh, uh, this hadn't been done in, in Israel, in, in Judah, for, for years. And the people just, just ate it up. Ezra opened the book in the sight of all the people, for he was above all the people. And as he opened it, the people stood. And Ezra blessed the Lord and the great God, and the people answered, Amen, Amen, lifting up their hands and bowed their heads and worshipped the Lord with their faces to the ground. It says in verse 8, And they read the book from the law of God clearly, and they gave the sense so that the people understood the reading. That's my job. That's what a pastor is supposed to do. You read the Word of God and you explain it so that people can understand it and know what it means and apply it to their lives. That's what Ezra did. That's good. Um, and this is so interesting. In, in verse 9, and Nehemiah, who was the governor, and Ezra the priest, the scribe, the Levites taught the people to say, uh, taught the people, uh, taught all the people, this day is holy to the Lord your God. Do not mourn or weep. For all the people wept as they heard the words of the law. Then he said to them, Go your way, eat the fat, eat fat and, and drink sweet wine, and send portions to anyone who has nothing ready. For this day is holy to our Lord. And do not be grieved, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. So the Leites calmed all the people, saying, Be quiet, for this is a, this is a holy day. Do not be grieved. And it, it basically became like Christmas. It was a day of celebration. Go home and enjoy a great meal and, and take care of the other folks who don't have anything. All because they started out by reading the Word of God. Uh, it, it's just a, a, a powerful passage. Chapter 9 begins that the people were assembled and after hearing the Word of God, what did they do? They confessed their sins. They understood that God was speaking to them about all the sins of the past, and they confessed their sins to the Lord. And in chapter 10, they basically sign a document saying, yes, I agree with all of this. I will do this. I will do what God's telling us to do. It's just a great passage, and it brings a great revival to the city that lasts for a while. The covenant was renewed, and um, people went on to live uh, until, basically, until the start of the New Testament. Well, quickly, that brings us to Esther. Who knows the story of the book of Esther? Repeat it for us. We want to do a dramatic reading. Dramatic telling of the book of Esther. Anybody? Aaron? Okay, fine. I guess I'll do it. Volunteer. Okay. So, basically, we're in captivity. Yeah. Israelites are in captivity. Yeah. And the king, was it, it was Syrian? Ashuerus. Yeah. Xerxes. Because he got mad at his wife. Sent her out. Mm -hmm. And then he was like, man, I'm all alone. So he asked, he got all the girls from the right. kingdom, right. brought them all in, yeah. and looked at all of them, and then he chose Esther. Right. And she was an Israelite, but he didn't know that. Mm -hmm. So he brought her in, and they got married, and then she stayed there. But then this other bad guy, who was like an official of the king, Haman, he got mad at Esther's uncle, Mordecai, because Mordecai wouldn't bow to him. And so he, in revenge, wanted to kill all the Jews. Right. Mordecai found out about this, and told Esther that she had to go tell the king so that they would not all be killed. And so she invited him to a banquet and then invited him to another banquet. Okay, let me stop here for a second. Did, did Esther want to go in and talk to the No, she, he, she was not. And what did, what did she say about that? She was like, well, I guess if I'm going to die anyway, so I might as well go in and all right. what, tell Just before that, what did she say? For such a, she, yeah. she was there for such a time for as this. For such a time as this. this. Yeah. Great statement. Okay, yeah. go on. Okay, so anyway, so she invites the king and Mordecai to this banquet. 
And right there, she says to the king, this guy's trying to kill me and all my people because I'm a Jew. And so the king got really upset and, you know, killed Mordecai and in, like, irony. Oh, oh, Haman. Yeah, I'm uh, sorry, Haman. Yeah. Sorry, he hanged Haman on the gallows right. that Haman had built for Mordecai. Right. So, and then he made a decree because he couldn't undo the previous decree right. that was going to kill him. So he made a new decree that everyone could get up and defend themselves. Right, right. Good. Very good. That was absolutely good. Yeah, that was pretty good. That was beautiful. Yeah, I like it. <laughs> Esther was written to those people who did not return to Jerusalem during the captivity, after the captivity. They, some re remained in Babylon and scattered other places. And God didn't want his people to think that just because they didn't come back to Jerusalem that they weren't important to him, or that he had forgotten about them. And so Esther is, is written, and, and the story is told to, to show that in, in a, a foreign land, a foreign kingdom, God's people were going to be protected by him. Regardless of how wicked the people in that land may have been. And Haman, uh, one writer says he's the uh, Adolf Eichmann of the Old Testament. His, he was just committed to destroying, to wiping out the Jews. And, but God said, I'm going to protect you. And, and this whole story of Mordecai and Esther, and, and it's just a, a great, great story. But it's a story of God's protection of his people, even in a foreign land, where they may have thought that they were forgotten by God, but clearly they were not. What's the, what's the one issue with the book of Esther that everybody always talks about? No God. No God mentioned. No mention of the name of God in the book of Esther. <laughs> Why do you think that is? How do you explain that? There is no mention of God's name in the book of Esther. Some have suggested because it was written to people, people in a foreign land, that it would be sort of dangerous for them to refer to God. Um, but most evangelical scholars point out that even though God's name is not specifically mentioned, there's probably a few other books in the Bible that are more clearly indicative of God's working and God's power <laughs> yeah. in, in the midst of his people than the book of Esther. So it certainly does not disqualify it from being part of the canon of the Old Testament. It is a wonderful story of God's mercy and grace to his people in the midst of great, great hardships that they were living under at that time. And it's really interesting that that persecution, that, that, that preservation of the Jews at that time is still going on today. I mean, for 2,000 years, the Jews have been separated and, and scattered to the ends of the earth. But God is still caring for them. And God is slowly bringing them back to Israel. And Israel is becoming a very powerful nation again, at least politically. Not really committed to God like they ought to be, but they will be someday. But, but that whole process of God's pre preserving his people that we see started in the book of, Exodus, of, of Esther really is continuing right to today. It's really part of the, the Abrahamic covenant in Genesis 12 where God says, if you bless Abraham, I will bless you. Yep. And that's a literal promise. And it's being fulfilled even today. Sure is. Well, now you know all there is to know about Old Testament history. <laughs> <laughs> I told you at the beginning, this is not a class on Old Testament history. This is a survey. This is a flyover of some of the highlights. And now we're going to look at the wisdom literature beginning next week. This is the literature that was written for the Jews and by the Jews to express their longings, their desire, their aspiration for this Messiah that's been promised to them. Where is he? Who is he? What's he going to be like? 
and, uh, and in the midst of their sorrows and their hardships and obstacles, they pour their hearts out to God. And, and we know some of the great themes in the, in the songs. And, uh, the other wisdom literature is like that as well. So, you have your assignment for next week. Pick out one of your psalms that's your favorite to you. Think about it a little bit and share with us next Sunday what, um, what you got out of that psalm. We'll, we'll take some time to do that next week. All right? Next Sunday is the last class. And then we take a two-week break for Christmas and New Year's. Um, We'll be back the second Sunday in January, after next week. We'll be here next week. Okay? All right. Thanks, everybody, for being here. Any questions before we go? Comments? Lesson? Uh, sorry, I came in a little bit late, but can you, can you talk about that assignment for next week again? Oh, yeah. Uh, instead of reading something and writing out a summary, I just want you to choose one of your favorite songs and and be able and be willing to share with us in the class next week why it is your favorite, what you got out of it, what you think it says, that kind of a thing. Okay. All right. It seems strange to me that God knows the end from the beginning. But yet he will he will give people positions that's being gained and saying, if you will if you will serve me, you know, I will do well. Knowing that they're gonna fail. But he acts like he acts like he don't know that. Or maybe he don't I don't I don't know how that how it works out, but he, he gives them the opportunity and then when they do fail, you know, it's like, okay, they had the perfect chance. He actually acted like they were gonna be perfect with it possibly. But he knew the end and still allowed that that feeling that they had at the beginning, that they had the opportunity to serve the perfect. That's because God did not create human beings as robots. He has given us a mind. He's given us free will to an extent. And we can make choices. And he wants to see that we make choices to serve God of our own volition, that we want to choose to follow him. He knows, of course, a lot of people are not going to. And he lets them make those choices too. And they will be judged for that ultimately. But, but God, God didn't create robots. I keep harking back, I keep harking back to the cross because it's so wonderfully illustrated there. Where the Lord, where Peter says in, in Acts 2 and, and, and 4, and he, basically points the finger at, at those Roman soldiers and Jewish leaders and said, you killed the Lord Jesus Christ. You killed your Messiah. Ouch. And he holds them accountable for that. But of course God planned that from eternity past. He planned to use every one of those men. But yet he holds them accountable for what they did. That's going to be the the uh, the destiny of every person who ends up in hell. God says, I, "I, you had the opportunity. You chose to go your own way. Well, now you're going to pay for it." 